Good morning, everyone. Education is fundamental to achieve a full human potential, develop an equitable and just society, and promote national development. Providing universal access to quality education is the key to India's continued ascent and leadership on the global stage in terms of economic growth, social justice, scientific advancement, equality, national integration, and cultural preservation. For every aspiring Christite, preparing themselves to face the future world, we present to you Daksh 2023. Members of the audience, a very good morning to all. Christ University is pleased to bring to you all a, a brand new edition of Daksh, the annual flagship event of the university. I am Gayatri Prabhakaran, and I will be your MC for the session. Daksh, the annual education and career guidance fair hosted by the Student Council of Christ deemed to be university is a one-stop destination for all things education. At Daksh, we get you to witness exclusive opportunities and imperative student guidance, acquire varied knowledge and make informed choices regarding your education and career. Without further ado, we present to you today's session, New Education Policy and its Implementation, delivered by Dr. Anil Joseph Pinto. To say a few words about our speaker for the session, Dr. Anil Pinto serves as the Registrar and Associate Professor in the Department of Theatre and Performing Arts at Christ Deemed to be University, Bengaluru Central Campus, India. Sir has also worked as a lecturer at St. Aloysius College in Mangalore and as a visiting scholar and United Board Fellow at Baylor University in Texas. Anil Sir has been with Christ University since 2001. Sir has a Doctor of Philosophy in Translation Studies from Gandhi Ram Rural Institute, a Diploma in Cultural Studies from Center for the Study of Culture and Society, a Film Appreciation Course from Film and Television Institute of India, and a Master's Degree in English Language and Literature from Mangalore University. Sir also has a Bachelor's Degree in Journalism, Communication, English Literature from St. Aloysius College, Mangalore. In addition, he also has an expertise in the theory and future of higher education. So, thank you so much for joining us today. Over to you for your speech. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I developed a technical glitch on my PC, so I switched over to the laptop. Uh, thank you, uh, Student Council, for this opportunity to share my views on the uh, NEP at this Daksh. Uh, there, I, I want to check with you, is there an option for question and answers at the end? Would the audience be asking any questions at the end so I can plan accordingly? So yes, we do have um, a space for question and answers. All right, thank you. Just give me a minute and I've, I'll start off. All right. Can you 
Echo. Uh, once again, thank you. Sorry for the little pitch. It was uh, uh, not my control. Um, now, uh, NEP, certainly National Education Policy 2020, is uh, certainly the uh, most important uh, landmark policy in the history uh, of education in India, not only from 1960 to from when the first policy was done, it's also landmark policy uh, in the last. Uh, uh, 150 and 70 years of higher education in India, which in some sense began in the early 19th century. We had the first universities in India in uh, uh, British universities. When I say first universities, we had universities. When I say the universities, I'm not referring to Takshin Nalanda, I'm talking about modern universities. Modern universities in India are there from the 18th century. But the British universities, in the way we today function as universities, begin in 1858 in Calcutta, Mumbai, and uh, uh, what is today Chennai, then Madras. Um, uh, and that model has, you know, continued as, uh, as of today. And it's since that moment, 1858, this is perhaps one of the most important landmark policies, at least for higher education, not for primary education. Primary education, I think, the uh, 1960s policy itself was a fairly landmark policy. But for higher education, I would say that from 1858, the present national a very, very important landmark because it structurally changes many things uh, for higher education, which have been practiced from 1880 uh, Having said that, uh, I somehow think that we need to locate the national education policy, the idea of what a university is, and then come to it. So I will briefly spend time on this very important question which people do not ask, and that is what is a university? Before we talk about uh, higher education, national education policy, what is a university? and then move to NEP. And I will close with uh, uh, spending time on the recent um, UGC uh, credit curriculum and credit framework for undergraduate program, uh, which was issued on December 12, 2022, about a uh, month, uh, 10, 20 years ago. Uh, I will close with that and then I'll take questions. So let me take you to share the screen and uh, uh, can you enable me screen sharing? Okay, that's the okay. beginning. Are you able to see the image on the screen? Thank you. Um, yes, sir, the screen is Thank you very much. Yeah. So uh, on the screen, uh, sorry. Let me take you back. Now, one of the uh, questions, uh, you know, which is which is important question to ask, as I said, is what is a university? And uh, uh, when I when I ask this question, I do this very very answers. Many times they say it's uh, engaged with knowledge, and I will say, okay, I mean, even, who is not engaged with knowledge? That mother who cooks a new recipe in the house you know, is also engaged in knowledge production. But uh, so you know, and, and therefore we need to come to what is something very distinct about university. And there are, uh, I will present three uh, ideas of university uh, today. One is an idea of a university by Henry Newman, also called, called Cardinal Newman. This is perhaps the most cited, most uh, important work, landmark work in understanding the idea of university. Published in 1852 uh, in India. And uh, uh, so where I have just taken a few extracts, where it says university is a place of teaching universal knowledge. So when I say teaching, it's not researching. And second important word to, uh, words to highlight is universal knowledge. That means not one subject, but a university should have all subjects, arts, what we call today arts, that time this concept of affair, science, the commerce, management, medicine, engineering, all of them, and not just arts, not just science, not just engineering, not just medicine, not just law, you know, uh, uh, not just education, not just dental sciences, which is a way in India, university institutions function. Uh, and second is that he says, what is a university should by a human reason and not by any authority. By authority, for example, is not that the law will say this is a university, no, but the human reason should arrive at what a university is. And third is, not in the same order, this is my order, is that 
uh, professors, of course, they will teach universal knowledges and uh, rest of it. And last part is important for me, is university education is to have a personal influence of teachers on students. This is a universal. So first two and last that point there, I'm things I'm not to follow this context, that it should teach all subjects. Students should have an option to study any subject under one roof. And second is uh, the, it should be determined by human reason. And the last important is that in the university education, teachers should have personal influence on students. These are one idea of the university. The other idea of university that emerges in uh, Germany in 1810, and the university is established around it, but here also he establishes one university in, in Northern Ireland around these principles, right? So uh, where he for the first time introduces medicine as an important subject of a university teaching. So, um, uh, and, and, and many other subjects, along with him, any other classical subject. So he, he does uh, tamper with the idea of university while writing this idea of uh, reflecting and writing this book on, which was actually given lectures, which he made, later makes a book, uh, and it's available on Project Gutenberg or to just search online. And I would certainly recommend that all of you to read this book. Second idea of university comes from uh, Wilhelm von Humboldt, who uh, says that uh, in 1810, and he sets up another university called uh, Humboldt uh, University, which is today called Humboldt University of Berlin. Uh, and there he says, you know, university has three separate functions, or three distinct functions. And he says, university should produce knowledge for the state. Right? Remember the previous one, there is no idea of the state here, right? It is knowledge for knowledge's sake. As, and in fact, the word comes from here, this idea of a university. The second idea of university, no, it is for the state, it's for the government, it's for the citizens that the knowledge should be produced. Uh, and second is, it should be disseminated. How to disseminate knowledge? Through workshops, conferences, seminars, writing articles in newspapers, publishing articles, writing books, teaching, and this is how you disseminate knowledge, right? Uh, 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 and third is to produce future knowledge producers. And technically, universities, therefore, universities first have to do research. Remember, in the previous one, it is teaching. Here it is research. First is produce research. Second is disseminate that research, and third is to teach. That is to train future knowledge producers in, in the way you have produced knowledge. And he, of course, managed that particular institution that he set up, goes on to produce, I mean, just instead of few alumni, some of the finest thinkers who shaped the sciences and social sciences and humanities in the 19th and 20th century. The entire sciences, and some of you, from different disciplines, from your own disciplines, you can see you have uh, Fichte, your Schleiermacher, your Hegel, Schopenhauer, Schelling, Benjamin, Einstein, Max Planck, Karl Marx, Engel, Socio, Wismar, Dubois, Schumann, Heisenberg, Weber, Kassirer. All of them come from one single institution. I do not know of any other institution in the last 200 years which has produced such giants who, who shape knowledge across the world in sciences and sciences. This is absolutely. Uh, uh, I mean, there's only. I mean, I just picked a few, and there are more. And of course, uh, there are uh, there are cases. I think John Bull Germany and the The third idea of university, which is not by Tagore, this idea was in, that existed, but Indian context, something that Tagore uh, built his own in in the name of Vishwamitra. Is where that the students, uh, the, the, the universities for the community. The community has problems, community has solutions. The university should work towards solving, resolving those uh, solutions. So that is the third idea of a university. Um, so the Ushwadi students, in his imagination, have to go to a village and solve the problems of the village, not as consultants and experts, because in this area, even villages are experts. But you also have some knowledge, they also have knowledge. Together you try and see how you solve the problem of the village. And this institution also produced some of the finest uh, people like uh, the novelist Mahasheva Devi, uh, Satyendar Bose, the most, most an important figure in science. Uh, some of you perhaps know of the Hydran Collider where we were trying to, when the world was trying to find out what particle or so boson is named after uh, Bose uh, who proposed it. Uh, Satyajit Jitre, you know, landmark uh, filmmaker of this world saw, Amartya Sen, Nobel Laureate, Tadagandhi, Pisim, Malam is an important name 
who designed the entire way uh, India uh, collects its data uh, five years. It was designed by uh, Mara Lovis. They all came from this. Day. So one of the points that I, I want to make is that this, there are, although there are these three ideas of university, the NEP actually combines all the three into one. Uh, and uh, uh, not so uh, when I say NDP doesn't do it for the first time, the UGC, if you see the UGC uh, 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 circulars and uh, advisories coming to university in the last uh, uh, 15 years, you will see that they have been coming in various ways, right? So NEP in some sense uh, structures it, gives a formal shape to that. But you see that, you know, uh, university <coughs> began to, NAC began to, Put research as an important criteria for universities. It is the highest you know, points for university assessment. All these <coughs> came from that framework. And when UGC says you must build values, there should be community engagement, all that, uh, both before NEP and in NEP, it is trying to bring together all the three frameworks. And so, what does NEP 2020 with regard? I'm only focusing on NEP as Chris I which is concerned. I, my job, my, my purpose is not to to a detailed view of the NEP 2020 with regard to higher education, but only highlight the major points uh, that are important from a student point of view and institutional point of view. So I'm not looking at this, in, 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 the session is not to make you understand that in but uh, most importantly, highlight some of the important things that are important as a student and as an institution. Uh, so one of the things you just, I mean, in which NEP says is that you should, should have students strength of more than 3,000 in an institution. That looks very, you know, for some of you maybe, you know, what's, what's a big deal? It's a very big deal because just about three to six percent of the institutions in India have enrollment more than six. We have 54,000, 55,000 actually, more than 55,000 high education institutions as per the test data that includes colleges and universities. And only three to six percent have more than 3,000 enrollment. So why that is important? Because the idea is that if you study in a small institution, then you will not grow. Your horizon doesn't. If you want uh, universities to produce good research, you, if you want to, you want universities or colleges to produce well-rounded students uh, who have interacted with the students from different different disciplines, different knowledge domains, then you would need this number. Imagine you have only three hundred students, a pilot student. How many subjects can you offer? You can't offer too many subjects. Therefore, you just in, in NEP thinks that you need to have minimum three thousand students. And maximum of 25,000. But that maximum will cross easily. I think that's a doable number to, to handle. I think uh, because of world class universities, the average number is about 45,000. And even within 2,250 universities uh, in times of education, I mean, you see many of them have uh, enrollment close to 1 lakh, 1 1.5 lakhs, and things like that. Therefore, uh, but it's 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 a good uh, thing to what is important to understand the philosophy. Similarly, uh, uh, you should uh, 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 HGI to develop community engagement, which I already mentioned. Battle development, uh, uh, they should do. Uh, they should be holistic education. They should encourage liberal arts. Liberal arts uh, means that uh, you know you can provide education uh, in the in the in the. In the uh, humanities, uh, social sciences, and basic sciences. Right? So it doesn't mean that only arts, liberal arts is not just arts. It's it's it, uh, uh, well-rounded education that comes from both sciences, social sciences, and humanities. Uh, academic bank of credits, um, uh, where the, this is already functional, where uh, 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 even before NEP uh, came in existence, the idea was there. There was uh, 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 credits were put in uh, all students' data were uh, was made available in um, uh, uh, locker, uh, uh, and uh, of course now uh, a separate platform is developed under the academic credits where institutions are supposed to after every semester upload the students' marks and credits in that uh, so the students can you know see it and uh, if the students uh, want to move from one institution to the other they can mission to uh, access those credits and institution can spell their genuine the required credits they have and then uh, they can give admission to them and if after they graduate so, you know, companies or government uh, which wants to verify your data can actually verify here that's the advantage of uh, academic 
credits, then uh, uh, credit-based courses and projects and community engagement services, choice-based credit system, which means that students can choose the, you know, their, their courses and credits and decide their, their own curriculum as a full curriculum. Uh, they can decide curriculum of a program or a course, but how they uh, the string together is something that students should decide. Focus on continuous and comprehensive evaluation, uh, having a large number of students uh, in the country, and for that, Government of India has already established a portal where foreign students can apply a single portal and uh, can give admissions rather than them approaching hundreds of institutions and not knowing the qualities. And uh, multiple institutions, uh, you should have all departments, big institutions, uh, multiple institutions also have a department of education, often BA ed and MA ed. Uh, because uh, this is an important one because uh, most institutions uh, until recently in India, uh, uh, education were well, separate institutions. They're not part of the other institution. There's a problem in that, which I mentioned to you earlier. Then the BA teachers who go out and teach high school, they, do have, they have not interacted with the other disciplines as a result. Uh, high school teaching and learning will suffer and therefore and governance by uh, highly qualified independent boards, uh, uh, especially this is for government. Where the uh, having institutions are controlled by the government uh, and political parties, and uh, that then affects the uh, way institutions can go and chart their political path. And phasing out of single same institutions, which means, as I said, most institutions in India actually are not multi, majority of them are single stream, right? just be it offering just, uh, you know, uh, offering medical MBS, just offering BTEC, just offering. Um, Dental sciences, just offering physiotherapy, you know, nursing. So they are not, you know, multi institutions or just arts and science, just commerce institutions. So that's something that you can be says you should stream out, uh, this is phase out, uh, and phasing out the affiliated part. This is perhaps the biggest, uh, one of the biggest, biggest uh, recommendation national policy. Because other things that they have said, there are many institutions that are that are already doing it. But this is something because of the law, uh, they were not even open. This is a great thing that you perhaps know this that in India we follow what is called affiliation system, where uh, university technically doesn't have undergraduate. Most universities in India do not have undergraduate programs, they only have master's program, they offer PhD. Then what do they do? The state universities. They have a lot of colleges under them, ranges from you know, even 400, you know, there was one university, even 800 colleges under them. And these colleges, what can they do? They can only teach. They can't decide the curriculum. They can't decide what program to offer. They can't decide the fees. They can't decide, uh, you know, whether they can start putting next FAM. And they can't develop their own uh, students' marks. They can't award the fees. All the done by the university. The only thing they do is teach. And about, you know, uh, for 50, 52,000 institutions are under this system. And this, I think, uh, in my personal view, one of the important reasons why uh, our country hasn't grown the way it could have grown for the last 10 years. And facing out is certainly a welcome thing, and uh, it will certainly happen uh, by 2025. Uh, and colleges will also award the uh, Now, this public system is not in any part of the world. They're only in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, and India. So, uh, countries. Uh, then vocational education, and uh, that if you see, for example, when you study uh, in your colleges now, you only taught physics or chemistry. Or you don't learn skills that are making employable, right? So if you do physics, what do you have to do there are? If you learn a lot of skills, how to write, how to write, many things you learn, but it doesn't prepare you for a job. So what the NEP is saying is that you should also embed vocational education in place for uh, and uh, uh, the UG can be three years or four years or five years, and PG one or two years, and it can be PhD can be uh, after fourth year. Multiple entries, so you should be able to exit and you should come, will come back. It's already been uh, implemented by UG, where you can exit after from next academic year if the universities permit uh, and they change their regulations. Can exit from the institution after first year if you and, and you say exit when I say exit, not like taking a PC, but walking out with a certificate. So you will say undergraduate certificate in commerce, undergraduate certificate in physics, right? So if you have uh, uh, 44 credits, 40 credits from the subjects and four credits from vocational uh, based 
Well, then you can exit uh, after the uh, 20 second year. And third year, of course, you get a degree. Second year, you get a diploma. And the fourth year, you get an honors degree. Then there is blended learning that is online, offline, not um, offline, campus and online learnings. And uh, 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 PhD. PhD. Uh, some of these are some of the key recommendations that uh, makes. And of course, that there should be three types of institutions, research intensive, teaching intensive, and, and, and you should also teach languages. So I will, uh, oh, okay. So, uh, and gross enrollment ratio, the gross, gross enrollment ratio is that within the age of 18 to 23, in a, in a country, population 18 to 23 is years of age, how many are there in higher education? So this is about 27% uh, in India today, and uh, policy says you can cross right. Now that's the uh, average because some of the country it is very Tamil Nadu has already crossed to 50 or 50% now. So technically, what country in India will reach in uh, 2035? Tamil Nadu has already crossed. So uh, so it's technically therefore you know someone's like, so but policy will have to have a country where the benchmark. So I want to say and there are some you know, states are very, very low, even as, as low as 10%, uh, which is uh, sad because when India be independent, all states had similar uh, enrollment ratio. But uh, some states, especially southern states of Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Karnataka, Karnataka has not done too well, Andhra Pradesh. Uh, Karnataka is just uh, a little above this special average, but some of the states have been phenomenally well, uh, better in the 30s and 40s. Uh, so, whereas some of the states uh, in India uh, are, as I said, in the, uh, not single digit, but uh, just, just in early digits. That tells a lot about policy. Um, so, and uh, 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 high performing universities encourage to campuses abroad. And top up universities in India, and there's a single regulator. So, one problem a country does register I face is that there'll be one direction coming from ASD, and you know, another direction coming from UGC, another coming from National uh, Council of Education, another coming from the Council of India. And I have to keep you know, uh, uh, catering to all of them, and the many times they contribute. So uh, one will say I need a separate building, another will say I don't need separate building, and you know, so there is there is a lot of contradiction in, and then I have to start, uh, you know, creating separate committees uh, all the way around each of them, you know, to meet their requirements. It is started slowly changing, but that is creating unnecessary uh, hurdles. And they are saying that let's have single regulator, multiple, you know, uh, uh, units under it covering these. Areas. And the fee control, that fee, they should separate committee to decide on the fees. So uh, one of the things uh, uh, is, is, so what is new with this policy in, the, in, the, in terms of history of university I mentioned, as I said, uh, you know, the entity pushed them together, but a few things it does something new, which is not there in the previous uh, three models. One is that um, it goes beyond uh, uh, the discussion to factor globalization. So you can constantly see that, you know, the NEP is very well aware that we are a globalized world. And Indian labor will be needed across the world, not just in India. And, you know, so, uh, and, and, and what happens here is also the result of what happens just to the world and therefore we need to scale them accordingly. Uh, and it's also moving from uh, high education from the elite model to democratic model. So because when high education in Germany, they were thinking that in that country should be in that model. There is a really small group of people Idea that and this is of course not invention or anything. It's happening across the world because of the demographic, demographic and social economic shifts that these are happening. And the other last important thing is that multicultural, multilingual engagement with the national sector. Something new. I will now uh, switch to um, switch to the UGC uh, uh, document on credit and culture. So, Am I audible? I'm going okay, Kathy. Yes, sir. You're you're Thank audible. You. It, it's quite clear. Okay. Um, so I do have a few questions on behalf of. Sure, you. sure. I will I will pause and I will take and then I will go on. Yeah. Okay. Um. So so to begin with, the one of the questions is we spoke about um elite to democratic uh, yeah. transition, right? 
so does this also mean that now the universities will have more autonomy when it comes to uh, curating the curriculum and syllabus because we're also looking for a multidisciplinary approach so does that also mean that like we can have a much more wider choice and options in our curriculum uh okay so there are, there are two different questions one is uh, what is written democratic concept um, uh, given by I can't remember this name in the 1970s uh, by Professor from US, from Sunny from Pakistan. He came out this concept of uh, you know, countries moving from education uh, from elite to mass to democrat. And he said when less than 16% or 15% of a country's population, in the age group of 18 to 23, are in high education, we call it elite high education. This is only for elites. For example, when India became independent, only 3% of India's population was in high. Hence, it was an elite. I think even until 2004 or 5, we were about 16%. Which means that we were in the elite part. The elites had access to high education. And from there, he says, uh, from 16 to 50%, when the country moves, uh, of its population in the age group of 1823 moves to high education, we call it mass high education. And when a country's population in the age group of 18 to 23 above the person moves to higher education, we call it democracy. So it, it is this concept right, in terms of the enrollment. So that means more people now it's a flat system that have access. So, for example, although India's is about 27, 28 percent, is what is uh, uh, India's uh, enrollment ratio. In fact, this last week, uh, the latest data is out. Uh, but if you see in Korea, it's 88 percent. Japan is about the same, right? Germany is about. Um, uh, about 65 percent. So, uh, so many of the countries in uh, in, the, in the world have uh, enrollment far above, uh, and and there's a direct link to that and GDP. So the this this uh, yes, population becoming uh, having democratic access to a democratic sense of not democracy, but more than 50 percent will be central to the GDP as well, uh, and of course the other gender dimension. Right? Second part is about the autonomy to institutions in terms of uh, uh, curriculum. Yes, by definition, university has complete autonomy on curriculum. But the problem was with the uh, uh, affiliation model. The autonomy was only to the university, but not for colleges, which is where more than 90% of students enrolled. They are, they are, although they call university my enrollment, but they are enrolled in this college. They have no freedom. As a result, they cannot design a curriculum that is responsive to local needs and all that. And the university does, university has 800 colleges. They have to do some middle path and, you know, and technically the professors who do it are board of studies, they're generally PG professors. They don't teach in undergrad. They don't understand what really happens in undergrad. So though, but for example, you know, uh, team universities, private universities, uh, which, which primarily have a large undergrad, they have been doing their own curriculum uh, in terms of uh, they've had free. So, they had the point here is that only a small example how many uh, uh, universities, universities and private universities are in this country, not even 1,000, it's about uh, close to 300 or 500. That's all we had. So uh, only that many had that period for undergrad. Right? Because uh, state university is mostly focused on master. Central university also be also focused on master. You know, very small undergrad, large masters. So, uh, so, but so technically, it doesn't mean anything that we have freedom. But uh, issues where the large numbers are, so that is going to change. So, those 52, 50, or 54,000 institutions, which are colleges, they have no freedom. Only this 1,000, 100, 200 have freedom. That is going to change, and that is going to be phenomenal. Change. Like it's like um, uh, UTI, UTI in India, something like that. Kind of change. change the way you know we began to. Okay. Changes the way that one access education as well, and uh, uh, yes, from it. Uh, yes, uh, yeah. Let me say it. <laughs> there are other parts because we can see what will also happen is the cost of education go up. So okay. then the other issues start kicking in. So access is also you know power one. Okay, so uh, I'll just ask one more question before we move up, move on. Yeah, sure. Um. There's multiple entry and exit points with under, undergrad education that you had mentioned earlier. Yes. So how beneficial is it when it comes to the completion of education? Because now that there's multiple entry and exit, is there a 
how 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 much are the students going to complete that degree or how well equipped are they to f- join the workforce and when they pass when they their academics uh, i have uh, presented the the, the, the made a presentation on the new credit and credit framework so i have a specific slide on that if you permit me i will uh, you know say it when that particular slide comes sure sir right yes sir as of now i think these are the questions that we have i will i will and, and uh, please feel free to interrupt me any further Sure, sir. Thank you. I will. I will go to the uh, curriculum and credit framework. All right. Uh, so yeah. Before before I go in, I think one of the things that uh, I I really want uh, I was watching is uh, I mean what this. to uh, learn uh, is uh, one second is to you know uh, we should we should get into the habit of not just gaining knowledge from newspapers and websites you know this and uh, uh, some of those apps that push news to us because uh, they push you know it's a database and so many things Uh, we should search for news that we want to and in general if you are a university student or aspiring to be a university student you are getting a different realm of being a world citizen and therefore you should be able to have a habit of going to the original document so if somebody says you know this is a speech of so and so you should go and check on newspapers because they highlight some part of it they can't highlight the whole thing because these books are meant for that perspective on things um you should go to the original documents and search so if you want to know more about the nep of course you can search online and don't go to any you know website slides and all that go to any key document and read it's a very simple access document now new credit credit curriculum framework you can go to ugc website go to ugc website uh, um uh then just put ugc.ac in or just right and there you go to uh the Uh, section on notices. So scroll down to notices. Click on that, and then you just type the search box. You type the credit, some keywords. So that's the credit here. It shows the latest document which you just released on uh, on twelfth twelfth. Then click on that. And you get a, a public notice, and you get the framework here. It's about thirty uh, pages, but that's it is not really long. You can skip some pages. We talk about introductions. Read them on the background information. But if you straight away want to see what are the actual changes, you can come to page number this point here, three points, three points. Very touching, correct. You can start reading. I will also put this link in the chat in case uh, you want. Uh, you can access it later so that you can listen to it. Uh, now let me go back to the uh, presentation. So I hope you can see the slide. So if you see, so I am again. Uh, Again, I am not uh, going to make the detailed presentation on the current document. Is there? Please read and of course ask. I will only highlight a few things which are important. Let's go and point. This is slide uh, that you were asking, and I said I. Yes, sir. So, yeah. So what it allows is that it will now it will now say we can award a UG certificate, UG diploma, UG degree. So if you exit after first year, <coughs> and you have minimum forty credits. And you do one vocational course of four credits, or do a two-month-long internship in the industry or uh, society. Uh, you can um, earn a certificate, and you can re-enter. So you go to the UG certificate, not a TC, not a TC, a certificate which you can present to any other institution. And uh, TC is a transfer certificate. Uh, and you, you, uh, but you can re-enter with it. 
three years. Why three years? Of course, you can also re-enter after five, seven. But if you enter after three years, you can't complete um, your entire degree. Technically, you can enter even in the sixth year. Seven years, you have to re-enter the program. But your, the validity of the, 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 the credits you earned in first year to, end, to go for a second year is valid only for seven years from the date you joined the first year. Now, if you want to join up a second day, set up a second day. So, one, well, of course, you can disappear from the college. That is one day, but sometimes it cannot help you because some industry asks, do you have some qualification? You are saying, my quality is 12 standard. Instead of that, you can say, I have a duty diploma. So, you will exit up a second year and you have 80 credits. That is 40 from first year, 40 from second year, plus one vocational course or four credits. That you've done. Or it can also be again done through two months internship in the first year. Um, when I say society, well, Take everything is not industry, perhaps. You want to learn certain things, certain things, so you get some skills. Um, uh, maximum duration to enter is three years, and within seven years, you have to come. And if you exit after three years, uh, with minimum 120 credits, you can get a UGD. And if you say, no, I want to do a four year honors, especially those who are planning to go to the US for higher studies for masters, I'm sure you probably want to go, or otherwise, you know, you might. You know, because gradually we are not sure, but it looks like uh, students in India might think a three-year degree is not a complete degree, but four years complete degree. They might think like that. In which case, we can have a four-year uh, degree honors and minimum credits of one sixty. Uh, and in the fourth year, you have two choices. Right? Those who have more than seventy-five percent in the first to sixth semester can say, "Look, I will do a, 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 a fourth year by research." And uh, so they need minimum 60 credits and 12 credits for project and presentation. Why this is so important is that if you do honors by research, you can directly go for PhD. Right? Uh, in the in the after your after your academic. So that's why this uh, honors by research. Then a UG degree uh, programs can have a single nature, uh, which is uh, let's say you study only physics, only only physics with other. Courses in skill, ability enhancement, value added courses, and some. Or you can go for double major. So those are the possible. And you can also go for a interdisciplinary program like um, life sciences. You need to study life sciences, you need chemistry, you need uh, botany, you need uh, biotechnology, you need zoology, also you know, uh, all of these. So that's what the industry For example, you want to do something in economics, 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 some math, some stats, you need all of them. Maybe some computers. That is called an interdisciplinary. And you can multidisciplinary programs. And you can combine saying, I will do uh, history and uh, let's say physics or history and chemistry, whatever. So you can also do programs like that. Uh, you have any questions back to here? That was your question was around this. Um, so you did answer the question pretty well. All right. Thank, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. So one of the things to remember is that this is what UTC has given us many more. But if you see the Karnataka government's uh, recent uh, Frame, uh, framework that has come out, uh, they have come out with for their uh, state called universities and affiliated colleges, is that they have put this minimum credit at 136 uh, for double major. Okay. So, this may, so, so what it tells us is that this is the minimum UGC has prescribed. Universities may not prescribe this as minimum, or they may say that for some programs, this would be the minimum credit, and for some different, because they may have a particular vision for a program, the skill sets they want to build into students, and therefore it may be 22, 25, 30, 35, 36, it's not accounted as um, So this is what I wanted to say that just because you want 20 credits, uh, university may not, you can do a TC and good analysis, that's possible, but you may not be for degree. The degree is not awarded because you have credits. The degree is also awarded for some of the other things that you fulfill. For example, university says you must do some 10 hours of social work. For which there are no credits, but as a requirement for degree, so then you will have to do it. So that depends on the way universities will have their, uh, you know, uh, graduation requirements uh, put down uh, as rules. Um, next is um, the the types of courses also have been changed. Uh, you have uh, major courses and minor courses, both of which have four, four credits courses per course, and there are courses in Three credit courses in multidisciplinary ability analysis courses, language, skill enhancement, enhancement, enhancement courses. Then you have common validated courses, which are two credit courses, and dissertation, which is kind of two. They're not important, just to tell you that the diversity. Some of you are who are in CPCS model. Uh, 
then there are types of courses. So, in, like they can be lecture courses, tutorial courses, practical courses, seminar courses, internship courses, studio activities. It's a concept borrowed from architecture, but can be used in context of other sectors. Well, field based practice, unit engagement. All of these will be eight types of courses that the credit uh, framework mentions. And uh, they have given the minimum requirements to award of degrees. So they should be in the in, in major uh, you know, form, they should be at least uh, 60 credits. <clears throat> uh, so you can be a math divided by four and you get your, get your number of courses. Uh, and if you're honors, particularly you want, you need 80 credits. This is UGC, as I said, but universities may go above in for them in six. Minor scheme, you need 24 credits or 32 credits for year. Multisciplinary, you would need, uh, this is the, uh, uh, you know, uh, you need to take a few multiple courses in the first year. Best first year, thank you. Yes. The ability in enhancement courses, which includes English and local languages, or that credits. Skill enhancement um, is uh, nine credits, and valid courses, summer internship. This is how uh, the various uh, credit distribution, there's a minimum credit distribution. For example, universities may say, I you have to more ability in courses for graduates from my university. So, like, some university may say that okay, you need to study English and the Canada, and then you need to also study French. Uh, my let's say hotel manager might say English and French because it's important for my subject, it is important. Then you, your credits may go up there. Um uh yeah, so then uh yeah, so you can also uh, in the first year supposed to take courses from other disciplines like natural sciences, physical sciences, mathematics, stats, you can choose. You know, any one of these streams or combine all of these. Uh, this is the uh, <coughs> uh, nine credits that you saw earlier that commerce and management, uh, humanities, and things. But what is important is students cannot repeat courses starting in 12th standard. For example, you're a commerce student and then you want to do something in, uh, uh, in, in, 12, in your 12th standard and uh, say accounting, basic accounting. And then again, you can't do a course here. But you can do something, let's say, uh, not on a course in literature, so you can share literature or what is international social mathematics. Uh, so you can do it, you not done mathematics from the trends. So, this is a well, what is valid forces that explain it to me, what you call Constitution of India, India, sciences. Uh, course codes will change. In this module is most important. Is to, uh, again, uh, the recommendations in EPA are based on the US education structure, American education structure. So, this is also one of the things that is borrowed from there. Uh, by the way, undergrad in the US is four years, uh, most of it. Uh, similarly, the course codes in the US are also based on the level. So, the prerequisites are zero to 99, and the, it's not the year, first year courses will not be 100 series. Right. The point is that the level of first years, what that if that is 100, 100 series, then intermediate level is 200 series, higher level is 300, 400 series, 500. So this is a course course in your transcript will change in the future across the country. Um, so this is how semester wise distribution. If you have to go through this, otherwise I will not find them that. This is how your semester wise, um, you know, roughly marks per level. So if you have a discipline course. It will see mass card we see semester per semester. We have course in this your discipline you choose, minors, discipline courses, all these other. What is interesting is that you notice that ability enhancement and skill enhancement will end by second uh, th uh, third semester, that is uh, first year uh, one more half year, that they all will end. So, so which means that uh, why this is this way? Uh, all institutions will have to ensure these courses get over in this in the first three semesters, so that in, when every institution follows that, it becomes easy for the students to migrate from one institution to the other. But what is important, of course, we keep talking about anti multiple exit, but uh, um, uh, not many students will exit and at least not in the near future. Because you know, for good institutions, students will not easily leave. One challenge in India at the moment is there are not too many things. So, uh, and there are other, other aspects of you know, 
particular institution in another case, the, the house is closed by the other city, then you know, the housing, rent, all that. So, cost of education. There are many factors which will limit the ability of the students, but certainly an option that is there. And I don't think uh, even UGC expects many uh, students to uh, move from one that is Next is um, uh, so letter grade. This is something similar. Many institutes are movement, so I don't know this. Uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, Wages can be changed. If they can be, this is again depending on the institution. If they have that much of space and uh, provision, uh, in, uh, and that's something that. My, my presentation ends and uh, questions. Or... I so I just have one last question and then uh, we could move on. Um, so it was regarding the emphasis on global quality level of education. So there's so much multidisciplinary aspect to it, and there's um, you can change your major. So how is how is all of this going towards that direction? Like how are we being benefited as students from that global quality level of education? Uh, yeah, this is something that many universities, especially the US <coughs> and many other parts of the world, offer that so you can change in the physics, physics and, uh, maths, um, teacher, and post uh, But uh, there are a few issues. And uh, one is that in the US, the graduation rate is very, very low. Let's say, even the institution has graduate rates are low. Because one of the reasons I feel is that this choice, you know, is too much. And, and you take and don't realize you're not uh, uh, good at it or thought it was great. You know, like for example, I've seen so many students love media, they join media. But when they go and join the profession of journalism and they realize it is not as rosy and as uh, heroic as you think, and you know, many of the news are uh, actually produced based on. Uh, not hurting the government, not hurting the companies because of the advertisements, you know, all sorts of I mean, things. You realize, you know, the idealism that you believe out through student life doesn't exist. And then you, you drop out of it. So, um, uh, so, those are the, some of the, so, you know, those are things that will, you know, be, uh, you know uh, which, uh, some things like that. And as a result, the graduation will be That's a challenge that, uh, you know, one can expect, or it may not happen. Even the cultural diversity, because we are, you know, we are not extremely a uh, affluent country. So students may not make those easy choices since I'll come back and I'll be some other time. I have to get a job and you know look after my parents and my family and you know other kind of So uh, but there will be I think different tiers of institution. There will be tiers of institution charging very, very high. When I say very high, it will be upward seven lakhs per year just for teaching. And uh, so they will be able to offer diversity. And the students who can afford that kind of diversity will do that. There will be other institutions which will limit that kind of a choice in within science and social sciences or something like that. Or they will say, look, you have to decide your major, but why not? I'll give you choices. Things like that. So these kinds of things will, uh, will happen. Quality of education will it change just because of that moment. Quality of education depends on many, many things. It depends on the quality of teachers first. Uh, and second is quality of university leadership. These will be the most important factors that will be then determine the quality of the institution. So if you don't have quality leadership in the institution, then uh, they may not hire quality teachers uh, and, and, and things like that. So <clears throat> because quality teachers also will be demanding teachers, they have their own views, you have to manage that. So those are the aspects that will be done. But uh, certainly these things will work for the better for this uh, country. And, So um, thank you so much. Uh, I think with an implementation of um, NEP, there's so many questions that uh, that came across as to how does it change the way we perceive our undergraduate degrees, and when ex when exactly does it become a diploma, and what can I do with it, and would I gain industry experience? So as a student personally, over the growing years, um, we're still a part of the the existing education model, and we see increased emphasis on internships and opportunities as such. 
So from coming from that point of view, I think this is really great because now this is integrated into our academic system. It's much more formalized. So it, I, it definitely opens up a lot of opportunities for students. Um, thank you so much, sir, for sharing your insights and your time with us today and clarifying, setting at least a discussion about NEP and um, clarifying the basic idea of it. I hope uh, our viewers today has gained a new perspective on NEP and they are one step more closer in deciding what kind of program they want to choose in the UG and making an informed choice. Um, so thank you so much, sir. Uh, wishing you a lovely day. Thank you. Thanks for the questions and thanks for Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.